allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Agenda item 4.0 is the workshop, and 4.1 is the curriculum assessment presentations. I'll turn it over to Edie. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited to join you tonight and give you an update on where we are academically in our district. So tonight's workshop, yes. we were so excited. Oh, we were so excited. <laughs> So our workshop tonight will review the academic data available to us in literacy, math, and science. Monique last spring gave you what she had up to June 1st, so I'm going to continue the conversation from that point. If you recall, we did not have updates on MEA science or the main through year because those had just been taken, and so those results came in this fall, and then I'll also give you an update on the fall data that we do have uh, right now. Before we do that, we'll just go to the next one. Yeah. Um, before we do that, I do want to give you a little history on the landscape of assessment in Maine so that you have an idea of where the data is coming from and what we're talking about when we say there's been a lot of changes over the years. So I think it's helpful to know this. So in 2009, Maine joined the New England Common Assessment Program with the intent of allowing New England states to compare data in literacy and math. And that program lasted for several years, but in 2015, Maine opted out of the NECAP and switched to the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. And they did that to align with the federal release of Common Core Standards which had been adopted by Maine as, the, as part of the Maine Learning Resource at that time. Almost immediately, they moved away from Smarter Balance and began working with Measured Progress to create Empower Me. It continued to assess literacy and, and math standards against grade level expectations. And that continued for three years, but was disrupted by COVID in 2020. When the COVID disruption happened, the states applied for federal waivers for assessment, so you'll remember that there was no assessment given. In we would have we would have assessed, I think it was like one week later after the closure, in March of 2020, and we were exempted that year, and then we were exempted in 2021. And so, that at that time, Maine adopted the MAP growth measure. Now, unlike the previous assessments, that's a norm referenced assessment. So instead of comparing students against grade level expectations, it uses a normed reference chart to compare students across um, against national expectations based on how they fall um, on what's essentially a, a, a curve scale, right? And so in 2022, Maine was told that you need to provide an assessment that is grade level referenced. The questions need to uh, align to grade level standards at the state and students need to be measured against those so we can just, you know, see what, how they compare to expectations at grade level, not to each other. So in 2023, Maine began to work with NWA to create the Maine through year assessment. The Maine through year assessment is interesting because um, if you've seen the video that I sent out to families, it produce, it's one assessment that produces two scores. The mean scaled score provides an indicator of how students are doing against the grade level questions within the question bank, while the RIT score continues to provide a reference against the NWA's national norms. So we get two scores from one assessment, which is they're able to do because it continues to be an adaptive assessment. We did not see an adaptive assessment for grade level questions prior to this one. So that's unique. What I think is important to point out is that NWA's partnership with Maine um, exists in creating the assessment. NWA's creation of the assessment 
happened in Maine, and they also partnered with Alaska and Nebraska. So there are three states who are using NWA to create their state assessment. And that means that bank of assessment questions is pretty small. Um, in, that, in, in that regard, um, it's important to remember that they've been building this really over the last two years. Third through eighth grade assessment questions had been field tested in the other two states they're working with, Alaska and Nebraska. But it is important to know that those states are not assessing high schoolers. And so Maine field tested, operationally field tested their questions last spring. <clears throat> Generally in the past, when Maine has field tested assessment questions, they've not produced results. This year they did choose to produce results because they had to submit results to meet federal timelines for funding. So I thought that was really interesting. Thank you. I've got two questions from mm -hmm. Virginia Round up here. One is when you compare, when we have the RIT uh, for the national average, national norms, mm -hmm. um, is it just against Alaska and Nebraska? No, those national it, norms are, are for any, for every, for every okay. um, school in the nation that utilizes the NWA MAP growth assessment. It okay. provides the same RIT score that um, Maine has assured us. And there's lots of presentations I'm happy to send you the link that are quite lengthy about how they do did remain comparable. Yeah. Uh, the NWA assessment is provided to about 6 million children, so it's a really comprehensive assessment. Okay. So those scores have a, a lot of longevity. That assessment's been around over 15 years. Okay. And question number two is, um, Given all the changes, how likely are we to change again? I think that's oh, completely. Sorry, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> Stingy heartburn, doesn't that? That's awful. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. not. Right? <laughs> we always hope that they don't, right? Yeah. We we want an assessment that we can use year over year yeah. to really compare the same cohorts of kids against the same banks of questions, because that is what gives us the that closest apples to apples comparison. But is I, it like I have administration an, like a Augusta is that the DOE? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, completely yeah. based on the NWA. Um, <clears throat> I know their current contract with NWA is through fiscal year twenty five. Oh, okay. So I, I have no idea That's where they are in negotiation for further. Contract. Well, and the challenge is like when that previous slide. I mean, the smarter balanced assessment. And then there was actually two iterations of the measured progress yeah. tests that were all very different. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, well, it's like a slightly modified, different standardized test, but it's d asking the same types of questions and skills. It's, they, were, they were really different yeah. just in terms of how they assess. Has it always content. been this? Okay. Yeah. That it, the inconsistency in the actual assessment is an unusual. It's very helpful for you guys. Yeah, very helpful. <laughs> Um, and so not to be outdone in science, so coming for them, um, you know, science can't be outdone. So it's all, I do want to make note of the fact, too, that though MEA science has maintained the same test name, mm -hmm. in 2021, they began to draw from an entirely new bank of questions. They started using the New Meridian Science Exchange Bank. And so they... They did an operational field test in Maine in spring of 2021. So kids in fifth, eighth, and the third year of high school took the administration, but no results were released to the public that year. So in 2022, we got the results, and we got this year's 2023 results. So I say all of this to really frame for you that the state assessment is one year of results. The science is two. When we're comparing like apples to apples. And then the writ itself, we can compare with a little more longevity because we did use the NWA map growth in 21 and 22. So there's a little more continuity there. So those are the scores I'm going to share with you. We also have been using iReady in K2. And I'm going to give you just a quick glimpse into iReady because the fall data is really best compared against the spring results because we're looking for movement in the distri 
distribution of placement of students. And by that I mean we're looking to see how we can move kids forward in their instructional pathway and that is best seen fall to spring. So I'm giving you a quick glimpse into how they are entering their kindergarten, first and second grade years. This is for all three schools at the grade level. So how are our kindergartners across the three schools in Scarborough doing first grade, second grade? And what we really wanna see is a bunch of green and yellow because that indicates that they're instructionally ready to enter the school year. So you'll see that that is the case in reading and in math. And so I look forward to bringing this, the results of the spring assessment back to you at the end of the school year so you can see the redistribution of their placements because historically that has always been really exciting to see when I dig into the data and you did get a glimpse of that if you go back to June, the June 1st presentation. <coughs> So the next thing that I want to go to is the main through years spring 2023 results. I have two different views of that assessment. So the first one is the summative achievement levels. This is Scarborough's distribution of students at well below, below, at and above for all of the grade levels that took the assessment. And I think it's interesting to look at, but and I think there are you know, questions we can begin to ask, but it's important to keep a low level of inference because we only have one year of data, and so it's hard to determine with this being a new assessment. And the high schools is really an operational field test to say like what, what's going on with the assessment, how does it relate to curriculum? Those questions are pretty nebulous right now until we have more data. Does this ring true to like feedback or what you're hearing from the teachers. Like I'm just looking at it, and I think we talked about this in like the seventh grade, uh, where we got 27% or below, <clears throat> or well below. Like, do you does that ring true to you based on what you hear from the teachers? And does this feel representative from based on what you hear? I mean, I think that's hard to assess without multiple years of data because. The teachers themselves don't have any history with the assessment yeah. either, right? Yeah. And so I think that's a question that is important to ask as we continue to assess over the next couple of years. Okay. Do the teachers end up getting the questions and getting access to the tests so that because they can be sure the curriculum? No, because it's a state assessment and the, the banks of questions are used year after year, we do not get questions from the state. There have been assessments in the past in which they release retired sample questions, but because this is a new assessment, there are no retired sample questions. The only thing the teachers do get is an indication of how the student answered correctly or incorrectly on a standard. So it may say, for example, in operations and algebraic thinking um, at fourth grade when they're um, doing multiplication in this standard 4.1, they answered correctly. Um, this assessment also gives them an indication of whether or not it was easy, considered an easy, medium, or hard question, and that's the statistical probability from the state's measures on how likely a student is to get that correct. So uh, medium, I don't know the exact statistical breakdown without pulling up the notes, but say 25% of kids get this correct, so that's a hard question. Is kind of what it indicates. Building off Shannon's question, do the teachers get to see how their kids perform? They do That's, get to see how their students perform, okay. but keep in mind that these these results mm -hmm. came to us in October, so their class had already moved on. Yeah. <laughs> so what's ex what I'm really excited about is moving forward, the state has assured us that the window is now closer to 72 hours after the release oh. of the assessment window. Yeah. Um, while they'll be able to see how their students performed and can consider instructional questions. It's <clears throat> instructional questions for curriculum planning as a whole. Yeah. Those assessment um, results will come out at the end of May, beginning of June. They're saying by the, the end of the first week of June. Kind of so there's not like, <laughs> we can't apply it to our students yeah. this year, right? And make instructional sure. changes yeah. within the classroom. And, and that's that always been true of state assessment. 
And that really speaks to what is the purpose of state assessment, right? Yeah. Because the purpose of state assessment is not for the state to know how every individual student is doing in the state of Maine. Right. It is to assess how schools are instructing students, right? And so as educators, we would like it to be all about each individual kid and we would like our teachers to be able to use the results of an assessment to plan and design instruction for individual kiddos. But that's not what the purpose yeah. of this assessment is for the state. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's not what we're able to do with it, right? Like, so our questions go back to, like, our, do our standards align? Right. Yeah. right? So are there curricular changes curriculum. we can make right. on, on a sy mm -hmm. system level, mm -hmm. but not on the individual level? And I, th I, I think what I'm hearing you asking, what I'm, I'm trying to, like, correlate what you're saying, what you're saying with this is, mm -hmm. So if I um, am the teacher and my students take the assessment, within 72 hours is the, the goal that I'll know where they performed and I'll know what specific areas perhaps they didn't do as well in. So is the idea that then the teacher can say, okay, this is my curriculum. I can make a little adjustments. I can go back and review this particular one that maybe my class didn't do as well on. Is that the hope going forward, even though so it's like still future oriented, right? Like that hasn't happened to date. Yeah. Right. Is that the goal going forward that that would be? And it may not even be at the classroom level. It may be at the grade level mm -hmm. where we say as a fifth grade team or seventh grade team, let's look at our results together and make curricular changes because... Um, like maybe the fifth grade not. team as a whole struggled with this one unit. Mm -hmm. Is that... Is that does that sound right? So that, that, that therefore yes. we look at the curriculum as yes, a whole. Yes, but keep in mind that these results are will be released in June, right? So we'll be right. forward looking to yeah. future future instruction. Yeah. I think the other thing too that we always ask ourselves is how is our system doing compared to the rest of the state? And so what I also included is our median scaled score for each grade level compared to the median scaled score in the state of Maine with uh, Notice the arrow. That 1500 score is the cutoff score for the scaled score to be considered at state expectation. And so we performed at state expectation in all grade levels in Maine. It's funny because, like on the last slide, and I'm sorry, I'm repeating part of what we talked about. The, Do you want to go back? Two weeks ago. No, it's just funny to see that bar chart and then. It's like middle school's tough. <laughs> we go, yeah, yeah, and I think we have to be careful to make any judgments yeah. because with it being the first time we've assessed, True. it's it's, yeah. um, it's hard to say whether it's our students or the questions, yeah. the bank of questions, right? Yeah. What's the alignment of our curriculum yeah, to the there assessment? There are big system yeah. questions there. And then we do the same in math where we are summatively in math. So my worry is, or not my worry, my question is, if we have, I'm just going to look right at eighth grade. If you have 57% of the students below or well below. So this would have been eighth graders last year that are currently ninth graders. Mm -hmm. And we don't have an ability to drill down to who specifically, because this is the purpose of this, is are the schools as a whole teaching. How do you know, how do you make sure that those that 57% of kids, that we've caught them so that they can catch up? Well, we, we do know that individually for students, right, because we send out those individual reports. So we do know who individually we can look at and consider what instructional supports we put in place within our school system. But again, keep in mind that they've already moved on, right? right. So we have to be yeah. future thinking. And yeah. also, I'll just reiterate, like this has only happened once. And so to, to that point, I wanna move forward just yeah, yeah. to talk about it in this lens as well. Mm. Uh, that 1500 mark, I've indicated it with an arrow, is the at state, le um, mm. at state expectation, right? And so we scored an eighth grade below state expectation mm -hmm. 
we still compare compared to the median score in the state of Maine scored above how eighth graders are doing. And so right. for here, there's like a little bit more of a pause for me because we are still quite in line with the trend you're seeing statewide. Mm -hmm. Across so the board. So th that leads me to more questions about whether, struggled in that grade. whether yeah. it's our curriculum, the, the, mm -hmm. bank, mm -hmm, the bank of questions and the alignment to the curriculum, right? Like, I think another year will give us a better lens to ask questions with, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So when was the eighth grade curriculum last, math curriculum last updated? Do you know? Um, I know that they had some conversation about alignment between eighth grade and high school in regards to course offerings mm -hmm. last spring. Okay. Um, the other thing you have to keep in mind is eighth grade yeah. has three different math programs depending on where a student is placed, yeah. unlike yeah. all of our other grade levels previous to that. Right, so yeah. so that means that start you know there's a segment of our students who aren't exposed to certain standards because mm -hmm. not everyone is taking algebra one, right? Mm -hmm. Some students are taking more of a general mm -hmm. math class or a pre-algebra pre -algebra class, right. right? And but this assessment is given to everyone regardless of what their math class is. So to give a really specific example, because I went digging into our course calendars to, mm -hmm. to take a look at this, the assessment bank of questions for eighth grade covers all four subdomains of math, right? So it covers operations and algebraic thinking, real and complex numbers, geometry, and statistics and probability. So if I'm, in a if I'm a student in an algebra one class, the bulk of my instruction is focused in the standards that pertain to algebra. So I'm doing a lot of work in like the real numbers, in uh, Pythagorean theorem, in equations and exponents, scientific notation, pieces like that, right? So what I'm not getting because I'm in a more tailored course is I'm not spending as much time on, say, geometry and mm -hmm. data and probability. In our course calendars, those happen in April, May, and June. And this assessment's taking, taken at the beginning of May, right? And so I think when you look at the high school, right, you see that score climb again because they're exposed to the standards through eighth and ninth grade within these more tailored course offerings. And as they're exposed to the wider range of standards, they're better um, equipped to answer that sub those that variety of subdomain questions. So I have I, I wonder about that too, right? The one thing that comes to my mind, just knowing my experience with my eighth grader, um, with math, it's, it's funny. He struggled with math in Wentworth. And then he's gotten to middle school, and it's he's it's like clicked for him. Mm -hmm. He's better. Um, but I wonder about you know, he doesn't come home with homework <laughs> very often. I wonder how much that has to play with cementing that in their heads. And I'm sure there's probably data about why we don't do homework or something. But it's just something that pops. I could do a brain. whole presentation on the effect <laughs> of homework. <laughs> That would be a great workshop. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, I would. I, I, I don't know if people would be thrilled to hear it. It has a very small. It has a very small effect size, honestly, on really? students' mm -hmm. um, solidification of knowledge and yeah. transfer mm -hmm. of knowledge. Um, research really indicates, and when I say research, I'm thinking of John Hattie's high instructional okay. impact strategies. Okay. Um, the research really indicates that it doesn't become an effective learning strategy until kids are in upper level courses in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Huh. Yeah, so it has I a very it, small impact. I think of it as like, if you are if you don't wanna bring work home, like your own business work home, you don't want your kids to bring it home either. So it's like work is work, school is school, just keep it separate. Mm -hmm. 
like I said, that could be a whole, <laughs> we, let's not derail ourselves. So um, the other thing I thought was really important is to look at this data in a different way. And so what I have provided you is a writ comparison of fall to fall to fall. So our third graders have only taken this assessment one time. Um, in the fall, they take the main through year, but the main through year in the fall is a fully adaptive assessment. It does not, I can't say it doesn't draw on the bank of grade level questions, it probably does, but it doesn't provide a scaled score, it only provides a RIT score. So we can compare the RIT score from fall to fall to fall. Third grade's only taken it once, so this is kind of the breakdown of their RIT. And so we look at that yellow, green, and blue as kids who are, are in the 41st percentile nationally and above and are really ready to access their instruction. And those kids who, um, whose scores are in the 40th percentile and below may need additional supports or targeted skill instruction in order to access their grade level instruction. And so this is how they have done in reading and math in their first attempt at this assessment. So I'll be able to update that for you next fall, right? Are there any um, national sort of, like what's the data on, it's, it, we don't want any children in the orange or red, like that's agreed upon, but what, what is a normal amount in that area? It's like a normal curve. distribution. Yeah, it's yeah. a bell curve distribution. Mm -hmm. I, I would yeah. imagine so. Yep. Like, the bell curve's in a good spot on both of these graphs, clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, like, you're yeah, always going to so have... I didn't put the, the... So the third grade RIT score in the fall um, for the 50th percentile is around a 187 for reading, 188 for math, right? So as parents look at that, I think it's important to consider... Um, where they're falling in that percentile, right? Because that gives yeah. you a better indication of where they are on the curve. And then I'm assuming we use this data to figure out what interventions are appropriate for students who are not meeting the expectations or in a place right. where they're able to access the right. education. Yeah, so we're able to dig into that data and look at the subdomains and see where, sometimes it's really disparate, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I did a little digging in on student assessments and they could have, say, a 210 in one area and a 176 in another, right? And that really indicates where work can be done to help them develop their mathematical thinking because they're really strong in one area and ready for growth in another. Right. Our fourth graders have taken it twice. So you're seeing the reading in 2022 and 23 and the math in 22 and 23. And one thing that's really important as educators that we look at is can we positively in influence the distribution of students mm -hmm. so that we're increasing the yellow, green, and blue and decreasing that orange and red. And you can see that that is happening here. Right? Mm -hmm. But I was going to pay all your, so it's just, that means all your interventions are working. It's getting that number down. And I think the other thing, instead of just focusing at the bottom, which I think is like an easy place to look at, you're seeing increases across the board. So you're pushing more orange, red into orange, more orange into yellow, more yellow into green, and more green into blue all the way along. People are making gains. Well, yeah. Being able to look at growth too and, and kids going from, you're not going to see a kid maybe go from orange to blue, yeah. right? But you're seeing from one band into another. Yeah, yeah. which is a really positive trend. You also have to look at what is the standard error mm -hmm. of the assessment, right? Because if it's plus or minus five points, it might mean today I took it and I'm in the yellow, but tomorrow I take it and I'm in the green. Sure. Right? Yeah. Makes sense. So those are the kinds of things that we want our teachers to be looking at mm -hmm. so that they can figure out, you know, like where are the areas of concern versus you know, what was a good testing day versus maybe a not so good testing day. One more question, which I think you answered, but I want to maybe say it a different way and make sure I get it. Um, so are the, are the tests in the spring and the fall basically maybe not the same questions but cover, cover the same material, or does it expect growth from spring to fall? 
I wouldn't say that there's growth expected from spring to fall yeah, because there hasn't sure. been a significant yeah. instructional period. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's certainly expected growth from fall to mm -hmm. spring. And so we can look oh, at... Oh, I meant, I, right. I said it backwards. Yes. Yeah. So, but that's <laughs> an important point, school. right? Because yeah. they do take it in the spring and fall. Yeah. So we want yep. to be careful not to compare yep, it that yep, way. Yep, yep, yep. Um, <laughs> but when we compare fall to spring, we can look at growth within a school year, right? So there are different ways to look at the data depending on what questions you're asking. So if we want to say, how has this year's inst instructional strategies impacted students, we might look fall to spring. And that's really helpful when you're like piloting something new or making instructional shifts. I really like the fall to fall because this shows us how are our students entering the school year for instructional readiness, yep. right? And how are the questions from fall to spring? Do the, do the questions anticipate, like, are the questions, like, in the fall, like, okay, these kids are just starting? And then so in what's the spring, they're like, okay, they've learned a few things. We're upping the, upping the material. So the what's questions. interesting about this assessment is it's fully adaptive, which means that it considers where the child left off if, if they've taken the assessment before, and they provide questions that increase in difficulty if they're getting the questions correct and decrease in difficulty if they're getting them incorrect. Basically trying to get to a point in each of the subdomains where they're about 50-50, right? And so once they've hit that point, that's the RIT score for that subdomain. So they're looking for a 50-50 correct and correct. So it really, um, the bank is is huge. What What's particular about the spring is there's a bank of grade level questions. Yeah that the mean scaled score is specifically drawn upon. And so that's about two thirds of the assessment. The other third is fully adaptive and does not contribute to the scaled score. But it remains adaptive. I think over time, if they stick with this, we'll see it be the possibility grow for it to be fully adaptive yeah. all year that's because the bank has grown. Yeah. Okay, so fifth graders. And our sixth graders. You can tell me to slow down. I know that it's a lot. And Katie, one thing that I don't think that we said a lot, but you have indicated on your slides, is that this is following the same group of students oh, yeah. over time. Yeah, let me be so we're not looking at like, you know, 2021 20, seventh graders, 22 seventh graders, 23 seventh graders. This is the same group of students over a three year period. Yeah, thank you. I might not have been explicit with that. So. We, we are really looking on these slides at the same group of kids and how they have entered ready for instruction year after year. So for these seventh graders, for example, 23, ball of 23's reading is seventh grade, the, graph, the bar before it is sixth grade, and the bar before is how they entered fifth grade. So we're talking about the same group, so same group of kids here, year after year. We're not talking about our seventh graders year after year. Will you be able to do this once they kick off into high school or I notice high school is I'll show you what happens. Yeah, I'll okay. show you what happens with high school. Okay. Yeah. I'll be able to give you a little bit of it because it's fascinating. Yeah. And then here's eighth grade. Don't track a growth of a cohort. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And so this is interesting to me, and this is why I'm excited to see how they perform in the mm -hmm. spring, specifically on the main three-year assessment, because we have 24% of students entering math needing additional supports, but we have 76% 76%? instructionally ready for math. So it'll be interesting to see that right year after year. And then for high school, they only take the assessment their 10th grade year. So what you're seeing is reading and math in 21 
which is when we last assessed them on the same assessment. So how, how they entered eighth grade and how they've entered high school. And again, you're seeing positive impacts um, on their readiness. A little bit of an off topic. Does this help you with, can you use this data to help you with planning or staffing? Like, okay, we need more support in math in you know, second grade, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. Does that inform you guys in any way with staffing? Or no? Yes and no. I mean, it's one source of data, yeah. right? And you never want to just look at one yeah. source of data mm -hmm. as information. We always try to triangulate the data, yeah. right? So that we can say, you know, this is one snapshot of what a student looks like, but are, what do other sources of information yeah. tell us about the student? Do they confirm that? Yeah. Or do they give us something different? Yeah. Right? Some, mm -hmm. some kids aren't. I was terrible at standardized tests. Well, right. That's, that's, that's one lens, <laughs> yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think yeah. what it does is it, it, you know, and Katie was talking about this too, is you're looking at what are the content and skills and seventh grade math yeah. and being able to break down the analysis of how that cohort of kids did in, you know, data analysis and geometry and, you know, algebraic functions, you know, being able to break it down by standard too to see, okay, you get a nice breakdown of where the, you know, what did the kids master very well mm -hmm. and are there areas that, that, that a bunch struggled and then that it yeah. will guide, lead into that curriculum review and Mm -hmm. Interventions. And in, in addition to the curriculum review, it may also really inform professional development. Yeah. Right. So there may be areas sure. where we recognize mm -hmm. um, significant areas for growth, yeah. whether it's at grade levels or base levels or even district wide. And mm -hmm. so this can be another data point that helps us make decisions about when and what we train teachers in to prepare them to teach. And as you've already alluded to, too, you're taking the tests at different points during the school year. So particularly in that fall, it's a little mm -hmm. tricky because you haven't gotten to a whole lot. Right. right. You know, yeah. and whereas, it, you know, the, the math assessment in May, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes there's, there, there are right. units that at the end of the year you haven't gotten to yet. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's also kind of timing and sequencing of when you're when you're teaching skills, or it could be a, a skill area that you didn't, that the kids haven't taught or uh, touched on since October. Yeah. You know, and they're taking the, the test now in early May. So that can be a factor too. Okay, I'm sorry. I keep oh, asking questions. <laughs> That's why we're here. Yeah. No, I think it's just fascinating. I, it I is don't want to keep you from getting through your whole thing. <laughs> but is that, but is that, you know, what, what yeah. we're talking about too is just having the data there so that you can have those data informed decisions mm -hmm. and yes. and teaming and communication with mm -hmm. teachers and, and, and more conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I also wanted to show you because the main science results came out in November, the results of the spring assessment. So I want to remind you 21 was an operational field test, so though our kids took it. We didn't receive any test results from that assessment, so we really only have 2022 and 23. And I think what's important is um, we have fifth grade in 22 and fifth grade in 23. So this is an assessment where they only assess in fifth, eighth, and high school uh, 11th, grade, 11th graders. Uh, the purpose of this assessment is absolutely uh, an opportunity for the state to kind of take a dipstick measure of how we're doing as a state in our instructional practices, but is certainly not meant to indicate um, like individual student success on this topic, right? And so you can take a look at our fifth graders in 22, 23, and then that main bar for fifth, eighth, and high school is how the state of Maine performed in their distribution of above, at, below, and well below expectations as a state. Uh, in 2023. Maine 2022 or 2023 or 23. 23. Yeah. I should have put the date. Yep. No, that's okay. 23. We do very well. Yeah, we are doing very well. 
this is an opportunity to look at our fifth graders right in the middle there and say, can we ask curriculum questions compared to last year? And then how are we doing against the state? Are there alignment questions we can ask there? Uh, yeah, you're right. Um, and families will receive, if, if their student took this, they will receive individual student results, and those have been turned over to the school. Um, so those, I expect to go out pretty soon. They've just gotten into their hands. And then really to wrap it up is just to know like we're always considering next steps with the data and one of the things we're really focused on right now is continuing to gather and analyze data through routine protocols and making those protocols consistent and timely with both our administration and with our educators so that when we talk about data it's consistent and expected in order to inform the curriculum review or instruction or uh, yeah, curriculum review or instruction. And then we also are always considering areas in which to dive deeper into the data so that we can look at those impacts and, and consider how we utilize this data for our support services, for our professional development, for our curriculum review process. That's what I have for you, if you have any other questions. So what you can anticipate in the spring assessment is a look from fall to spring on the information that we have updated, and then also how that informs, in particular, like our Title I services and our plans for, for Title I year after year. So I'll bring that data back to you in June once we have that. Great job. It is fascinating, right? Because is, I think yeah. when you start really digging into data, you know, I think going into it, you think, oh, I'm going to look at this data and it's going to answer so many things for me. But the reality <laughs> is the more you look into questions. data, the more questions yes. come up, yeah. Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. but, but that's the fascinating mm -hmm. part of the work, right? Yeah. Because you can really dig mm -hmm. into what those mm -hmm. questions are, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and explore that. Yeah, I have to like be sure to set aside time because I tend to go down that rabbit yeah. hole, right? Like with the questions. So yeah. a right. great example like is we did that the other day together, right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> like a great example is with the eighth grade math. The my first question is yeah. like what percent of our students are borderline, meaning yeah. should their distribution may have resulted in an at level expectation at exp state expectation, sorry. Um, based on their range of possible scores, like what percentage of our students in eighth grade math were borderline? And so right, I'm like, find yeah. myself hand tabulating going well, through each. And there was a big difference between how they did versus the hard cutoffs, right. you know, above expectations or below expectations, mm -hmm. versus the, the percentile normed results, which actually showed improvement from seventh to eighth grade math. Right. Yeah. So, it's with the same cohort of kids. And that's and, and you kind of saw that reflected in the Maine versus Scarborough results where those eighth grade results, everybody, all the eighth graders across the state got hammered on that test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so does that become an indicator to the test maker that perhaps the questions aren't I, quite in line with what eighth grade is teaching as a whole? Right, so that could be, that could be a factor, but I think what is also a factor is um, what Katie was talking about in that in eighth grade you start to get um, differentiated Right, the different, right. You know, and so you've got a whole group of eighth graders that are taking Algebra 1 that very well may not see some of the questions that are, are learned, you know, the, the questions related to geometry or, the, you know, some of the questions mm -hmm. related to, to data analysis. What's their exposure to the standards? You right. know, so and that, that's going to impact how they do on the, on but the then test we, of that. But, and, and the results that showed that high school did quite well 
Mm -hmm. But those students would have received geometry in ninth grade and right. really covered all those subdomains by then. So by the time they take the assessment as a 10th grader, they yeah, have right. gotten. Yeah. Well, and standards. even if you were in pre-algebra, like I can remember from my child who struggles in math, he was in pre-algebra in eighth grade. He did algebra in ninth, but then, so he didn't have geometry until 10th. Right. So when, so he would always be like, when you think of it from that lens, he would always be a little bit behind the assessment. Because the assessment yeah, like how do you ever right? Like how do you ever get to where you're actually getting a, a good? And this is, I guess, like an overarching question with standardized testing. Like how do you get to a place where you're getting a good, solid, concrete answer that the student has learned over all of their years, right? That they know they know the the common areas in math that they need to know. Like how do you ever get there? Yeah. And again. Like it's going back to what is the purpose of yeah. this assessment. Yeah. The purpose of, of this type of assessment is not to answer that question. Right. And it's right. Not. Because it's more of they're trying to give a reflection of us as a district, mm -hmm. not of each individual student. Or necessarily a reflection of what that student truly knows or doesn't mm -hmm. know. Right. Again, mm -hmm. it's a standardized test. Yep. It's a, it's you sit down on that one day and okay, yeah. let's see what you know. <laughs> yeah. And you know. If now, now, if you average that over, you know, how many kids are taking the test that day, you know, you get an idea. But, you know, a kid has a bad day, it may not be a reflection of what, right. you, of what you know, that child knows. Or, you know, maybe it is. Yeah. Yeah, we're, I mean, kids that particularly in seventh and eighth grade are really predictable one day to the next. So, so obviously it's yeah. going to be their best effort. Right. Every time. <laughs> Every time. Yeah. Yeah. They're locked in, man. <laughs> and I wonder, too, what you were saying a minute ago, you know, how much of it is maybe what's being taught has changed since COVID, you because know, kids fell behind a bit. Mm -hmm. So maybe the teaching us what's being taught is maybe not what it was a few years ago, whereas the test is maybe the same. I don't know. Do you have a thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what, like what I heard you say mm -hmm. a few minutes ago, Katie, I think is so important, which is mm -hmm. really important that we stay low on the la on the ladder of inference, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's so easy to look at one piece of data and say, oh, you know what? This answers yeah. this. This must mean that this is happening, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But like you have to really just take it at face value mm -hmm. and then again like that's the work that we've tried to really dig into mm -hmm. at the school level with our teachers is um and even with our with our leadership team right like what do you see in this data what questions do you have about this data but we're not going you know to draw some large conclusion yeah. over mm -hmm. one piece of information mm -hmm. it might be the question might be like, what other data do we have that, you know, either um, is similar to this or is different than this? Because then you can start, yeah. you know, going up higher on that. I on think that overall line. for all standardized tests, it's just, it only shows you a little bit yeah. of what go, of what actually goes on. Because you have so many different learning styles. You have mm -hmm. kids who, some just don't, test well but yeah. they are brilliant children mm -hmm. and just sitting them in front of a, a, a piece of paper or a computer now um, it just it doesn't work for them it's a, a, not a working model for them but their teachers know them well they can assess them throughout the school year just on basic things that that they need to cover and they can probably tell that they excel in a lot of these areas just not on a standardized test so yeah it's just these things are just like a small component of what it actually really encompasses. But if it was Fortnite, though, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then they excel. Yeah. And, to, and to like really stamp that point to Jenna, it's only assessing literacy, math, and science, right? It's not assessing our kids' ability to play an instrument or yeah. shoot a layup or have interpersonal skills to resolve conflict, right? There are a lot of other skills that schools teach that are never touched yeah. by these state assessments mm -hmm. in which kids thrive and succeed and shine. Um, so it's important to always remember that this is just very minute. Mm -hmm. 
students were lazy and hung up on it. It is, yeah. I have a second grader. I can't wait for the results, right? But, uh, And then when you look at like, um, you know, I know we have parents in the community that really um, like to look at um, ratings, school ratings and rankings. And I mean, I, I admit, like I, Jeff knows, like I, I like to look at them as well. I like us to be at the top or near the top. And um, so with the constant change, I don't, I don't know that they, the test scores, I think they've been included, but I don't know really how that factors in because there's been such upheaval for so many years. It's hard to like, just like we're having an issue. Everybody else in the state of Maine is having the same issue, trying to, trying to set a benchmark, right. And, and trying to determine what, what's good and what's not. And um, so are, are these now, are these a part of rankings? Are they not a part of rankings? These would not be included in the rankings because they were just released to schools this year. Those rankings are drawn upon from state public state aggregate data. So this, so in Maine, we have what's called the ESSA dashboard. There is a link to that under the curriculum department's assessment tab on our website. And that is updated in late winter, early spring every year. So I anticipate um, one of us will receive what will be going into the ESSA dashboard for 22-23 in the next couple of weeks from the state. Um, we'll have a period to look at that data before they post it publicly in case there are corrections that need to be made. And then you'll be able to look at Scarborough's data compared to other districts in the state. But I think it's important to use caution because um, our population is different from other populations, mm -hmm. right? And so I caution people for that. So they draw upon that aggregate data. And so it's always behind the latest data that we have. And not to go too in depth because we only have a couple of minutes, but it's also really important for the public to know how those scores are formulated because it's not a simple, like, we're going to give them points because they did really well and we're going to take away points because they didn't do well, right? There is, yeah. there are, there's a very specific formula that informs those rankings and I would encourage anyone to really look at what those formulas are. Um, well, we used to laugh about the U.S. News and World Report stuff because for high schools or even for districts, it's all over the map and, mm -hmm. you know, one year to the next. And there was one case where I think it was a report that we usually submit to the state that was a week late or something or got missed or, or uh, whoever sends the data to U.S. News and World Report. This was in Yarmouth uh, at the high school you know, it just didn't get processed right. And they went from like number one in Maine or number two down to like 15 or 16. <laughs> but nothing had changed. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. just like a clerical, you know, mistake on U.S. News and World Report's part. Mm -hmm. You know, and <laughs> so, I mean, and then, you know. They do a reprint. So you get like, you know, the emails, what happened? Oh, God. <laughs> the world's falling, and it's like, nothing. What's nothing that? happened, right. actually. <laughs> so, I mean, it, some of those rankings are just, are really not accurate or representative of anything, really. It didn't stop me from giving uh, Andrew Doloff some some grief about it. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Here's the opportunity. Yeah. yeah. What happened? Yeah. The place is falling apart over there. What's going on? Oh, all right. Are there any other questions? All right. Thank you so much. Thank this you. is really, really good. Yes. Yeah, thank oh. you. And I think what's great is, you know, we've kind of set ourselves up to continue looking at data in the same way moving yeah. forward. So I'm looking forward to coming back with updates. Yeah, that's and true. all upon the same, the same Perfect. And I love the fact that we're following the students in a cohort yes. model. Yes, me too. Right? Yeah. Because you can oh, see the stage of kids. Yeah, yeah really watch their time growth. Versus oh, let's compare one set of kids to another set of kids mm -hmm. to another set of kids. Yeah. Right, right. That you can't really draw anything from, right? right. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate you making the data yeah. so visually. Mm -hmm. I think that's Easy really important. Understand. It's got to be digestible, yeah. right? Yes. And I know this will be available to the public, yeah. which will 
better help them mm -hmm. look at the data as well. Reach out if they have questions. Great. Thank you. Nice. All right, we have about five minutes until our meetings. We'll just take a five-minute break. Stand up.